from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening, everyone. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all here this evening to the 2013 Library of Congress National Book Festival Gala. And I just got to start with a confession. I always wanted to be a writer. Growing up, it was, it was my dream. I wanted to be a poet. I wanted to write books. And then my father, who was a scientist, said, Greta, that's wonderful, but how are you going to eat? Clearly, the people we are going to pay tribute to here this evening have figured out how to do it. So we're going to applaud them in just a minute. And I have to admit, I ended up in television. And yet, I was never allowed to watch TV growing up. God knows how this happened. Uh, my father, we had a black and white TV in the basement, but we were not allowed to, we were allowed to watch 30 minutes a night. And um, my father put a, index cards next to it, and for each program that we watched, we had to sit down afterwards, take an index card, and write a critique of the program, <laughs> and send it into the TV station. <laughs> so, how do you, I mean, get smart, how do you write about 99's outfit over and over again, you know? And when Walt Disney came on, that was an hour, so we'd, we actually had another TV in another part of the house, so we'd sneak down in halftime and watch the other half and the other half. So anyway, long story short, I ended up in TV, but my heart is always with the written word. And so this is a great honor here this evening. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge our host, the gracious leader of this world-class center of knowledge, the Librarian of Congress, Dr. James H. Billington. And as those of you at the reception just found out, Dr. Billington's co-chairman of the National Book Festival Board, David M. Rubenstein of the Carlyle Group, has just pledged another $5 million over five years to continue his support for the National Book Festival. And that is a commitment of more than $10 million in total. So let's give another round of applause for that. That's incredible. Tonight, we're going to hear from five of the writers who will speak from the library's National Book Festival stages uh, uh, tomorrow and Sunday. And by the way, this is the third year that the library has offered a two-day National Book Festival. Nearly a million and a half book lovers have joined us on the National Mall over the past 12 years. We most sincerely thank the festival's sponsors, Wells Fargo, The Washington Post, Target, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the National Endowment for the Arts, and PBS Kids for their welcome support, and that all of the many sponsors, we could not do it without you. This event is an ideal public-private partnership, and there's no way we could do it without their support. Tomorrow and Sunday, you're going to have a chance to hear from and meet 112 authors for readers young and old. And you will also meet many of more than 1,000 volunteers. They're going to be wearing orange t-shirts. They're going to make this event truly a labor of love possible. Now, about half of those volunteers are actually members of the Junior League of Washington. So let's give all of the volunteers a warm round of applause. And I think the weather's going to be good. I think it's going to be good. We are also much indebted to the women's service group, The Lynx which is bringing several hundred students on buses to the festival this year. How does literature interact with and affect America more broadly? 
Oh, uh, I'm just reading a, a book by Ford, Maddox Ford, and in, in his, his own preface, it's a complex, difficult book, a, a sort of a quintessential modernist book. Yet he says that the task of the novelist is to present the picture of his own historical uh, time. And that's what I've tried to do, being a very different writer. But uh, f fact seems to me to be very powerful. And probably uh, conflict is, is the essence of story, one of the uh, chief essences of storytelling. And uh, so, so this uh, kind of thing uh, lends itself uh, to, to uh, narrative writing. Jim, my worst subject in high school and college was history. I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. It didn't make it, it didn't grab me at all. It was only when I had to tell a story that would reflect my own personal experiences that I saw that I was, I had lived through a vast war and then with another, other wars following it. And so inevitably, in order to tell the stories I wanted to tell because of, uh, the experience that I'd had, I had to make myself over insofar as I could as a historian, not a historian like you, but enough of a historian to be truthful in, in what I wrote in my novels. Herman Woke was the first of a line of towering American novelists who have been awarded honors for their work here at the Library of Congress. Since he was so recognized in 2008, the library has also honored John Grishop in 2009, Isabel Allende in 2010, Toni Morrison in 2011, and Philip Roth in 2012. And tomorrow, as we open the 2013 Library of Congress National Book Festival, Dr. Billington will name Don DeLillo as the recipient of the Library of Congress Prize for American Fiction. Don DeLillo. <laughs> Don DeLillo is one of the most acclaimed novelists in the United States. His novels, as you probably know, include Mao Tu, Libra, and Underworld. They have received numerous awards. His 1985 novel, White Noise, won the National Book Award, and in 2006, a New York Times survey of writers and literary experts named Underworld the number two American novel written in the past 25 years. Mr. DeLillo's most recent work is titled The Angel Esmeralda. Ladies and gentlemen, Don DeLillo. I thought I'd say uh, a few words about books and libraries and um, what they've meant to me through the years. And I'll start with uh, the most unusual library I've ever um, set foot in. This was in Portugal a few years ago. A few friends and I drove north from Lisbon to visit uh, a grand palatial complex Many, many, many impressive buildings, museums, paintings, but the most remarkable building of all was the local library. It's a 17th century structure, marble floors, arched ceilings, rows of bookshelves that seemed to extend into the distance, two-tiered bookshelves. leather-bound books, many thousands of volumes. And every night, a worker releases bats, flying mammals, <laughs> in order for the bats to kill insects 
that might otherwise damage the books. I wonder if this would work at the Library of Congress. <laughs> I grew up in the Bronx, and, and the, uh, the first experience, that was the first experience I had with libraries. And it still seems a wonder to me that I could walk out of the building with a 500-page novel without having spent a nickel. And it still seems a wonder. I um, eventually did begin buying books, spending not much more than nickels, and I still have very, very old paperback books, good books, <clears throat> 35 cents, 50 cents. They've survived uh, all these decades, words on paper. Eventually, um, I had an apartment, my first apartment, and I began putting my own words on paper. But first, I, uh, I established my own very crude library, unpainted planks, three or four, set on top of wall brackets. And um, I sat at a Formica desk for roughly four years working on a novel. And it, um, it eventually seemed to, to, be, um, to be finished. And uh, I couldn't quite believe it. Um, I gave the manuscript uh, to my sister to be typed more or less professionally. <laughs> and then it, um, it went to a publisher. And uh, in not too long a time, I was able to uh, call myself a novelist. It seems remarkable, even now, I've had a, a lucky life as a writer. And um, I think that perhaps here in the Library of Congress, um, this, is, uh, this has never been more clear to me than it is now. And um, having said that, there's nothing left to say except thank you. Thank you, Don. I'm not too sure about the idea of the bats. I'm having a bad hair day already. Christina Garcia is an author with an international following whose work has been translated into 14 different languages. She writes for both adults and young people. Garcia has been nominated for a National Book Award, and she is a fellow of the National Endowment for the Arts and the Guggenheim Foundation. Garcia is the University Chair in Creative Writing at Texas State University at San Marcos. Her novels include Dreaming in Cuban, The Lady Matador's Hotel, and Dreams of Significant Girls. She has just published King of Cuba, a comic novel featuring a fictionalized Fidel Castro. Should be interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Christina Garcia. Good evening. Thank you so much for inviting me to the book festival. It's my first time here, and I'm delighted to be with all of you. Um, last week, my first novel, which was published in 1992, Dreaming in Cuban, was pulled from high school classrooms in an Arizona school district on charges of quote-unquote debauchery and child pornography. My response, uh, many works, not just mine, are misinterpreted or misguidedly banned because of limitations and short-sightedness of a few. I added that I'd be willing to visit the school district to clear up any concerns. I bring this up briefly here because books, even in this day and age, are under attack as subversive, influential, and dangerous, which of course is the very reason they are so powerful. Beauty is dangerous. Surprising, unsettling language is dangerous. 
New ideas and ways of viewing the world, they too are dangerous because they upset the status quo. Literature, unlike many other human endeavors, is not in the mind and behavior control business. What books do is seduce readers, cultivate chaos. And books manage to do this one person, one sensibility at a time. For what is reading except two minds and hearts intimately, often ecstatically, engaged over time? From the time we're quite young, we're taught to distrust chaos, to play nice and clean our rooms, to plan a solid course of action and follow it. Good books mess with those plans. How many of us here believe that books saved our lives, derailed us from the ordinary, irradiated us with unheard of possibility? I suspect that if you're sitting here and wrestling with language on a daily basis, then you already know how trying to over-control your writing, especially in its earliest, most fragile drafts, kills the spontaneous ferocity of gifts that come with the wide-eyed and open-hearted embrace of what we only dimly perceive, of the random and the mysterious. We can't always describe this mystery, this wildness, but we know it when we read it. The strange, ineluctable, jagged-edged clout of the wonderfully, perilously unexpected. The feeling that the world as we thought we knew it has changed irrevocably. These moments are rare enough in life, yet great poetry and prose are replete with them. Moments from which there is no turning back and which often frighten us, confuse us, challenge us to ask uncomfortable questions. At our best, we write with our spines, move toward what scares us, toward our confusions, sink taproots into the deepest archaeology of our beings, our worlds, and suck up what we've been avoiding for too long. We hold the gaze and then hold it longer still. Two principles, often suspect, it seems, are always at work in writing, pleasure and obsession. By pleasure, I mean a deep and abiding surrender to language to play and self-indulgence, to scrabbling down blind alleys, to the crazy mess we make, which slowly, slowly over time, we hope to shape into glittering phrases which become freight trains of implication. By obsession, I mean that we write nothing out of a sense of obligation, that forced joyless march toward a preconceived goal, but create from a relentless sense of discovery and curiosity. A few years ago, I read an article in the New York Times about a scientific study that showed when people have experiences that violate all logic and expectation, anomalies that produce a profound sense of the absurd, their brains get primed for patterns they might otherwise have missed. In short, nonsense sharpened the intellect. This isn't news to artists, habitual travelers, and other curiosity seekers who've known all along that disorientation begets creative thinking. To write is to raid the unconscious, to coax the unknown onto the page, to explore, as short story master Grace Paley once said, what you don't know about what you know. Books are dangerous because they tell our secrets. Secrets that have been buried by shame or remorse, intimidation, effrontery, revenge. We dig them up, bring them to the surface, into the sunlight, whisper them, shout them, tell them in all their grisly glory. Toward the end of Chekhov's short story, The Lady with the Dog, is this startling passage. And through some strange, perhaps accidental conjunction of circumstances, everything that was essential, of interest and of value to him, everything in which he was sincere and did not deceive himself, everything that made the kernel of his life was hidden from other people. And all that was false in him, the sheath in which he hid himself to conceal the truth, all that was open 
and he judged of others by himself, not believing in what he saw, and always believing that every man had his real, most interesting life under the cover of secrecy and under the cover of night. This telling of truths is especially important for those of us from historically silenced communities. We must resist the narratives imposed on us, the censored, falsified tales that distort our realities. It is up to us to find meaning and story where we've been told they have no worth. To remember and to record loss, to fight against forgetting, to write until it hurts, until the hurting sings. The best art expands our interrogations of history, both personal and political. Every day our world is being shaped and reshaped by vast migrations around the world, by environmental degradation, by the actions and inaction of governments and businesses which result in upheaval, dislocation, and trauma to millions. We, as writers, refract these realities. We are in and of a historical moment, which no matter how painful or difficult, we attempt to turn into the stuff of art and illumination. I'd like to end with the last stanza of poet uh, Simon Ortiz's Culture in the Universe. It's not humankind after all, nor is it culture that limits us. It is the vastness we do not enter. It is the stars we do not let own us. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Christina. Some really thoughtful things there. You know, now I know I was meant to be a writer, Christina, because when you started talking about chaos, you've obviously been to my house. Thank you for that really amazing uh, comments that you shared with us. The prestigious Caldecott Medal for Illustrated Children's Literature this year went to John Clausen for his delightful illustrations in This Is Not My Hat, which he also wrote. His 2011 picture book was I Want My Hat Back, which was a runaway bestseller. Clausen took a huge risk with this book by having the bear whose hat was stolen eat the rabbit who stole it off the page, of course. He was telling me about it backstage, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's traumatic. You know, these kids are going to be having nightmares and everything, but no. He knew how to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm round of applause for John Clausen. Oh, everyone else's speeches are on this thing already. Thank you very much for having me. I'm always a little nervous talking to, about picture books to people, uh, literary crowds. A room full of people who are comfortable dealing with more than 200 words per book can be very intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> That's the joke, but it's not a joke. <laughs> Whenever it happens, I tend to find myself a little on the defensive, trying to find things that longer books and picture books might have in common. I'm not sure how useful an exercise that is. They are different forms with strengths of their own. But it seems worth mentioning that it was a novel, not a picture book, that got me thinking I might enjoy making picture books. Before getting into book work, I went to school for animation and worked at studios for many years as a concept illustrator, doing drawings for sets and props. Over the course of my school and work, I'd become less and less interested in drawing or thinking about characters. Normally, when you draw characters, you don't just draw what they look like. You draw them feeling a certain way. In animation, they put together these things called model sheets, which are pages of a given character doing certain things and feeling certain ways. Here's what he looks like when he's angry. Here's what he looks like when he's sad. Here's what he looks like when he's running frantically. Oh, now I've lost my spot. <laughs> these things are done early in the process, often before the story is worked out, so there's never any context for these drawings. And I always had a prob problem with that. It seemed meaningless and showy to go through the technical exercise of working out what these characters look like and what they were going through when we hadn't even figured it out yet. My resistance to this grew until I got to where I thought showing any kind of emotion, or even a character at all, was cheating. 
I instead got more interested in pictures and work that involved objects or landscapes. Alongside this, and maybe because of it, my way of drawing began to get simpler, with bigger shapes and less rendering to show how the form was being lit. Around the same time, I got an offer to do my first picture book. The text was a counting book about a growing number of cats dancing around a city at night. It's very complicated stuff. <laughs> you guys are so intimidating. I'd been thinking about getting into books, and this one seemed worth trying because the cats themselves had no personality. There just had to be the correct number of cats on the page, and that's it. <laughs> I enjoyed doing the book very much and decided afterwards that I would try and get enough book work going to leave animation. In order to make this financially viable, though, I had to start writing my own books. I was worried about this. It seemed like my growing distaste for characters was going to make coming up with book ideas difficult. I wasn't looking forward to making children sit still for my book about a chair that sat in a room and didn't do anything. <laughs> I really had a dummy like that. I got sad wondering if my snobbery had sabotaged this potentially exciting new area of work. My own reading habits hadn't been exempt from this snobbery either. I'd been mostly reading nonfiction for a long time, but, but it broke when someone gave me The Road by Cormac McCarthy. He's a little known author. <laughs> There's a deep cut, you know, you'll have some fans eventually. I hadn't read anything by him before, and it hit me pretty hard. I cried and cried. But I also couldn't believe how clean the book was. The setup was so simple. The characters were often too exhausted to act out any emotion, and the landscape was spent of anything that might bring out dramatic description. There wasn't even any light to cast shadows. It was so graphic, and yet it was hugely emotional. And it was emotional because of the economy and the restraint, not in spite of it. It showed that these qualities, if used the right way, didn't have to mean snobbery about emotion, but in trust in your audience, in their ability to recognize what you are implying, and the potential result was that you'd have them crying on their porch for an hour on a bright Sunday afternoon. Picture books are designed for economy. They are designed to be short and spare. The stories that suit them are simple in their setup and clear in their movements. They are also a perfect vehicle for people that enjoy implication. A story in a picture book is made up of two parts, the words and the pictures. This means that the actual story isn't stated explicitly by either side, but exists between them and is only ever put together by the reader as they, as they move through it. If a story has a boy seeing a box in a field, you can write, a boy saw a box in a field. But you can also just draw a boy standing in a field looking at a box with the text saying, the boy saw something. Kids know a box when they see one. This kind of thing gets especially interesting when you begin to use it as it might apply to emotions rather than just boxes. Children are the usual audience for these books, and fortunately they are especially good at this. I can remember being told I had to leave my favorite toy behind when I was packing for a trip, and being devastated for the toy and how abandoned it must be feeling. I stood there pouring everything I knew about how it felt to be left behind onto this unmoving object, apologizing to it, trying to explain. And the more it didn't move, the more devastated I got. It didn't matter that it didn't move. Kids know the circumstances of loneliness when they see them. If something is implied correctly, it can use everything you as a reader have got in the tank, back on yourself. And I feel so lucky to work in a form that is so well built to do this. Thank you very much for inviting me here. It's been very nice. Thank you, John. William P. Jones is an associate professor of history at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He is the author of The Tribe of Black Ulysses, African American Lumber Workers in the Jim Crow South, about the previously ignored story of African American men employed in the lumber industry in the southern United States. The book received the H.L. Mitchell Award of the Southern Historical Association in 2006. He is also widely published in magazines. His new book is The March on Washington, Jobs, Freedom, and the Forgotten History of Civil Rights. Ladies and gentlemen, I proudly present to you William P. Jones. Good evening. 
Um, there, there's a story that uh, the, a number of people organizing the March on Washington were actually upset that Martin Luther King was given the, the keynote address, the last speech. Um, he, was, he was younger than most of the other speakers, and, um, and for m many of them had been in the struggle a lot less, for, a lot, uh, for not nearly as long as many of them. But then in the meeting when people were complaining, somebody said, well, who wants to go after him? <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm not last tonight, but, <laughs> but these, this is a hard act to follow. Um, Christina Garcia's comments reminded me uh, of another book that was uh, banned last week. Uh, a county school board in North Carolina um, banned Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. Um, and in the debate, the, uh, the county, one of the county board uh, representatives said he, you know, he said, I, I tried to read it and it's, it's really, it's a really hard read and I, <laughs> I, I, I just don't think we should make kids go through that. <laughs> Which immediately, I thought, gosh, you know, it's been a little while since I read The Invisible Man, but I went back and looked at it and it's, it's actually an incredibly easy book to read. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> It's, it's very simple, so I think he was either lying about either having to do it or probably just wanted an excuse. But it's also, um, as, as my colleague, uh, the historian Nan Enstead pointed out, it's also incredibly ironic that the Invisible Man would be, would be censored. I mean, the whole point of the book is about invisibility of a people and the silencing of a people. Um, and, and I think... The, the degree to which you know somebody could could make comments like that about the book and and, and actually censor the book um, without being self-aware of that history, I think, is indicative of something about the nation that we live in that um, that often forgets history. Um, one of the reasons, perhaps the most important reason that I, I like to write history, is that I get to enter into that conversation about national memory um, and about about collective, a collective memory. And, and I actually think that, you know, I think it's, it's, on one hand, we live in a country that likes to forget and, and that often does not remember its history. But we also live in a country that is deeply driven by some version of that history and some memory. Um, so that even things that are informed by a, a, a perverted view of history are justified and driven by a view of history nonetheless. And the, the March on Washington, for me, is perhaps the, the most stunning example of that, uh, an event that 50 years later, people around the world not only know that it existed, but know several lines from one of the speeches that was given. Um, and this is an event that was, you know, at the time, an incredibly controversial event um, seen by all of the media and all of the public officials is a dangerous, radical, um, potentially incredibly violent event. And the fact that we remember it at all, and not just remember it, but celebrate it, I think is a remarkable um, testament to the degree to which our country really does value history. And so writing this book has been a really wonderful experience for me to be able to enter into that conversation. I think. Um, really deepen our understanding of this event. Um, while it is a very widely known event, it's, it is a deeply misunderstood event, both in its, um, in its organization, in its purpose, and I think perhaps most importantly in its impact, the way in which um, it's seen, I think, largely as being a moral statement uh, rather than what it was at the time, I think, seen as, as a way of changing policy and changing really in concrete ways the way in which the government enforced principles, uh, not just of racial equality, but of economic justice. So it's really been an honor to me to be able to write about this event and, to, um, and, it, and it's great to be able to come here today and this weekend and, and talk about the event at the place in which it actually occurred. And it's a tremendous honor for me to be here today, this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you, William. 
Actually, that I have a dream speech, I made that in sixth grade. I was in a, I remember that to this day. I got halfway through it and my mind went blank. <laughs> I'll never forget that, but powerful. Juan Felipe Herrera is the Poet Laureate of California. He is a winner of the National Book Critics Circle Award for Half the World in Light in 2008. He has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Guggenheim Foundation. In 1990, Herrera was a distinguished teaching fellow at the University of Iowa Writers' Workshop. He has taught elsewhere, including in prisons. His latest collection is Senegal Taxi, Camino del Sol. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Juan Felipe Herrera. Thank you so much. What a beautiful set of readers and writers. What a beautiful community. Tonight, at this very second, I really appreciate you being here. I really appreciate the support. I appreciate everything you're all doing. And thank you so much. Uh, I didn't become a poet magically. I became a poet with all the support that you could ever dream of. I didn't start that way. I kind of started as a cartoonist and uh, just a guy, you know, just a boy, just a boy in the fields, a uh, boy playing with ants and, and um, corn and watering bell peppers. Uh, my father was a farm worker. My mother was a farm worker. I thank them and I thank you, all my teachers. I've had so many teachers and they've been very kind to me and I, I ask them all the time, well, how do you set up a novel and, and what do you think I should do with this? And, and they go, okay, Juan Felipe, try this and try that. And I go, okay, I'll, I'll try that. And it's helped me a lot. So I'm really thankful for everyone. This is called Half Mexican. Odd to be a half Mexican. Let me put it this way. I am Mexican plus Mexican. Then there's the question of the half. To say Mexican without the half, well, it means another thing. Well, one could say only Mexican. Then think of pyramids, obsidian flaw, flame etchings, goddesses with flayed visages, claw feet, and skulls as belts. These are not Mexican. They are existences, that is to say, slavery, sinew, hearts shredded, sacrifice for the continuum. Quarks and galaxies, the cosmic milk that flows into trees, then darkness. What is the other? Yes, it is Mexican too. Yet it is formless. It is speckled with particles, European pieces. To say colony or power is incorrect. Better to think of Kant in his tiny room, shuffling in his black socks, seeking out the notion of time. Or Einstein reworking the erroneous equation concerning the way light bends, all this has to do with the half, the half thing. When you are a half being, time, light, how they stalk you and how you beseech them. All this becomes your lifelong project. That is, you are Mexican, one half Mexican, the other half Mexican, then the half against itself. Thank you so much. Wow. 
I just thank all of the folks we've heard from tonight for their inspiration, their creativity, their thoughtfulness. Just amazing. So thank you for sharing, and congratulations to all of you. Now we invite you all to the great hall and mezzanine upstairs of the beautiful Thomas Jefferson Building for our reception. Please note that the main reading room of the library, which is just to the east of the Great Hall, will be open this evening for you to see. And of course, that is a very rare treat. Also, the exhibitions on the mezzanine, including the Civil War in America, Thomas Jefferson's Library, and Exploring the Early Americas, all of them will be open. Thank you ever so much. We'll see you at the reception. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.